are continuing our series, Ripped Clothes to Tuxedos. You guys enjoying it? Yeah. Enjoying it? This series is all about God taking things in our life that are sucky, that are hard, and working in our lives. Making things work for the good in our lives, working through those situations. Um, so I'm excited today to continue on and talk about that. How many of you ever watched a movie where you know what's going to happen, right? You can, you can see what's, what's going to happen, um, and, and it's suspenseful and all that stuff. But, like, the person on the movie is doing, like, the stupidest possible thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, like a thriller movie, maybe there's, like, a killer. And the killer, you know, there's suspenseful music. And the killer's hiding in the bedroom. And, like, the lady comes home and there's eerie music. And the lights are off. And the window's open and there's, like, wind and, like, owls outside. And it's, like, super freaky. And it's, like, obviously this is scary. And the girl walks in and there's, like, a crack in the bedroom door. And you're like, okay, listen, lady, you got a few options here. You can call the police. You can call your friend. You can turn the lights on. You can grab a weapon. You could scream. Like, you could do all these things. But what happens? She's like, I wonder if there's anybody in the bedroom. I should probably keep the lights off while I check. And you're like, what are you doing? And you're like freaking out. Don't. Don't go inside. So I, I, have any of you guys experienced that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. If only that person in the movie could have known that the bad guy was in the bedroom. If only they could have known what you knew, then they wouldn't have made that choice. And uh, there's been many times in my life where I wish I knew the end from the beginning. Any, anybody else? Feel me? Like You're like, I wish I knew how this was going to end up. Before it happened, like I wish I knew, like maybe a relationship. Anybody, you're like, man, I wish I knew how that relationship was gonna end up. I know it's depressing, but you know, like you get, you're like, this is gonna be so amazing, and you get into it. If only you knew how it was gonna end, you could have avoided that uh, in some cases. Or how about a test? Anybody like have they get really nervous in tests? And like once you do a test, you're like, oh my gosh, like did I fail? And you're like all you can do is think about how sucky you think you did on your test. If only you knew, like, you know what? I'm going to get an 80. No sweat, man. Just go on the test. Do your thing. How about a sports game? Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anybody wish they knew how Wednesday was going to end up? Yeah, I don't know if, if I wish that. How about a conversation? Like, you know you have to talk to somebody, and it might turn out really, really bad. So you're going through your head like, how is this going to turn out? What are they going to say? What am I going to say? And you like think about that thing over and over. Anybody experience that? Is it just me or? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? If only you knew how that was going to end, you wouldn't have to worry about it. It would be awesome. You wouldn't have to make up all these scenarios. And usually it's not as bad as you think it would be. But I have to, I have to make a confession. There is many decisions in my life where if I knew the end from the beginning, I would have made a different choice. And I was thinking about this. And one of, the, one of the, the times in my life that I remember so clearly, so I was in grade 9, and in grade 9 I got my first job. Did anybody get a job before grade 9? Nice. I, feel, I felt like I was a late bloomer, like I, I started work late. I worked at Superstore. Anybody work at Superstore before? Anybody feel me? My man. Yeah, Superstore. So I worked at Superstore as my first job, and I was what you call the price checker. So, you know those guys that go around in the rollerblades? I haven't seen them in a while, but, like, th there used to be this job where, like, you show up to work and you put rollerblades on. And, like, when, uh, when the code wouldn't work or price was wrong, the cashier would call you and be like, hey, can you find the price for this? And you'd rollerblade over to the thing, find the price, rollerblade back. Hey, it's three sixty nine. dollars Okay, sweet. They do it. And then, they, like, people would get there. I mean, you don't even use people to do cashiers anymore. Now it's all automated. But that, that's what I did. I used, to, I used to be the price checker. And so there was some, you know, things got under pressure when you had a few things. You're like, oh, I got four items. I got to figure out the price. I don't know if I can handle this. People are waiting. But uh, when that wasn't happening, you know, it was a lot slower. But they're not going to let us sit around. We had to do work, right? So, you know, we'd have to stock the shelves or, you know, help people in the back or help certain departments, whatever. And, uh, and there, so there was this back storage area. That's where Superstore puts, like, some of their extra stuff and and whatever, if there's something broken, they want to return it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Throughout Superstore, there's cameras everywhere. But there's no cameras 
in the storage room. So, as a price checker, my man feels me. When you want to take an extra break that you're not supposed to take, oh, you just head back to the storage room. There's no cameras. No one's going to know. And uh, there was a few of us. There was kind of like a bad culture at Superstore. Hopefully no one who works for Superstore is watching this online. But what we used to do is we used to like, you know, we would go to take broken things to the back, right? So it would be like, oh, I'm going to grab a Kit Kat. That's broken. <laughs> oh, that Coca-Cola, that's broken. And so we would go into the storage room and we would eat our snacks and drink whatever we wanted. And it was kind of like we were basically stealing. And no one, no one ever caught us. It was like this thing. All the employees did it from all the different departments, especially the price checkers because we were all young kids and dumb. And so, so we figured this out. There's no cameras. This is awesome. And, but this one time I remember specifically, it was like this weird day. Like I felt weird inside. I don't know why, but I remember just kind of ignoring it. Like whatever. Like whatever. Why am I feeling weird? Maybe it's just a bad day. R woke up the wrong side of the bed. But you know those Coke commercials where, like, they pop the, the, pop can uh, the top of the pop off, and they like, it's like the perfect, you know, it's like the perfect whatever scene? Well, this is, like, what it was like for me, except for it was a bit different. Because I remember, like, I took this drink, and I was like, I'm going to drink this drink. And I had this feeling, like, don't drink the drink. I'm like, shut up, conscience. I do what I want. And so... Uh, I go, like, pop the top, and as soon as I go like this, I could see my manager standing right in front of me. And I was like, oh, no. I actually, I literally said, uh-oh. <laughs> I was in grade nine, man. Don't judge me. And the manager's like, uh-oh is right. So we went, you know, we went back into the back office. She took me upstairs and, like, asked me what was going on. And, like, I couldn't lie. You got caught red-handed. So it's like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, she sent me home and said, we'll send you a letter. And I got the letter. I got fired. And, well, but I deserved it. But if only I could have known, though. If only I could have known at that exact moment my manager would be standing there. I could have made a different choice. And, uh, and I wish I could have known the end from the beginning. There's only one person I know who knows the end from the beginning. And that is God. Let's check out this verse in Romans 8.28. This is what it says. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. This verse is cool because... In the context that he's talking about this, what he's saying is like, God, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything that's going to happen in your world before it happens. And the promise to us is that he's going to make things work out for good. Things that look like they're not going to be good at all, things look, that look like they're going to be disasters, God will work those things out for good. And that's a promise to us. And there's a few stories in the Bible. There's lots of characters who experience this. Uh, in the Bible, I want to share a few with you. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, but, but you can see, like, these people, the, the way that they start out in life, the circumstances that they have to fight against with where they end up, God is working some cool things in these guys' lives. So first person, Joel talked about him last week. The dude's name is Joseph. So Joseph's story, he's betrayed and abandoned by his own family. But if you follow his story, he ends up being the second most powerful person on the planet. So he gets sold as a slave, and then he gets accused of raping someone, which he never did. She was just angry that he wasn't as thirsty as her and that he wanted to honor God. And so he, he gets thrown into prison, and it's like 15 years before he ever sees anything good happen in his life. But the Pharaoh ends up needing him, and he helps him out, and he becomes the second most powerful person on the planet. Another guy's name's Jacob. So this guy, I would say, is born at a disadvantage. Basically, he was born into a family back in the old days where things were different. Two boys. But he was the second born. So in those days, the firstborn is the son that's going to take on all the family inheritance. He's going to carry on the legacy. He's like the man. He's like the important one. And, this, and the second son, he's like, yeah, you're cool, but you're, you're just the second son. So he, he, he grew up with a disadvantage, not to mention the Bible talked about he was a mama's boy, nothing wrong with mama's boys, but back in those days, he would have had to be the guy to provide. He would have had to be like the manly man carrying on the family name, and so he would have been considered kind of like a black sheep of the family, but if you follow his story, this guy ends up being one of the fathers of our faith. Like God refers to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Like he gets mentioned with the name of God. It's like pretty cool. He's in the ancestry of Jesus. And so he didn't start out too good, but he ended up in a pretty cool place. Another guy named Job. This guy loses everything. He loses like everything in his life. Like one of the most depressing stories. Like you think it was depressing watching the Oilers lose on Wednesday night? Man, try being Job. This guy loses his house. He loses all of his money, all of his wealth. There, there's a fire and his family dies, his kids and his wife. He loses all of his family. They all die. Not to mention he gets crazy sick. He has all this sickness. Like he's basically, you know, just like at the point of death. And this guy has to wrestle with his faith. But what's crazy is that when you watch his story, he ends up with like double what he ever had in the end of his life. Another guy named Peter. So this guy was, he's pretty popular in the Bible. He turns his back on Jesus. He betrays Jesus. He betrays God. He's like, God, you know, uh, uh, he rejects him in a way. So basically what happens is he was known as this really bold guy, this really kind of, you know, fiery, hot-headed, like, Jesus, I'll die for you. I will cut my own head off for you. He doesn't say that, but he, like, he's intense. Like, he's like, I will do anything for you. And then what happens, this little girl comes up and says, aren't you one of the disciples? And he's like, no. I don't even know who Jesus is. And it's like, dude, you're supposed to die for him and you won't even admit to a small girl because you're afraid that they're going to, you know, get angry at you or be like, this man was with Jesus. But as you follow his story, he ends up getting redeemed and he's like one of the most bold apostles that start the church, basically one of the disciples that really start Christianity after Jesus raises from the dead. Another guy named Paul, this is like one of my favorite Bible characters. So this guy, he's like a really devout Jewish guy and Jesus comes, Jesus is like, yo, I'm God. And then Paul, who used to be Saul, was like, you're not God, man. Like, you, you're, not, you're not the Messiah. You're not Jesus. Uh, like, you're just a false, you know, you're just trying to trick us. And he ends up, you know, basically being a hater and a killer of Christians. And, like, he devotes his life to that. It's not just, like, a hater as in, like, you know, most of you guys in here are probably like, I hate the ducks. But, like, Amen. he's like, I will dedicate my life to killing Christians and putting them in jail. Like, basically the Hitler towards Christians, if you want to put it into context. And then he has an encounter with Jesus, gives his life to Jesus, becomes literally one of the greatest church planters of all time, greatest evangelist, and writes most of the Bible that you read. Like, talk about a life change. And then lastly, Jesus. This guy goes through unimaginable pain. Like, excruciating pain. To anyone that was watching on the outside, this would have been a defeat. But you guys know this. You're smart. He ends up being the savior of the world. So God is working through these crazy bad circumstances and bringing good things out of it. Now, aside from Jesus, Jesus knew how this was all going to turn out. Lucky him. Everybody else, though, all of those stories, nobody, nobody knew the end from the beginning. Nobody knew how that was going to turn out. But if they could have known that, they would have been amazed. And they probably would have lived life a little bit differently, not have worried as much. Now, I wish I knew the end from the beginning when, you know, I took that drink in the back storage room because then I got fired, but I deserved it. But there's probably a lot of you in here that are going through more serious things, that have more serious things in your life where you're wondering how it's going to turn out and you don't know if it's going to turn out good for you. And I want to let you know that God is going to work in those situations for good in your life. Maybe you've had a breakup that was like a devastating breakup. You fell in love for the first time and your heart was broken and, you know, you don't know how to process that and it's like the most painful thing you've ever experienced. Maybe for you, you have a friend that betrayed you. You, like, trusted someone and they stabbed you in the back. And it's, like, painful. You don't know, like, how to, how to work through that. Maybe for you, you lost somebody in your life. Maybe someone passed away in your family or friends. Maybe for you, you go to school and you get bullied and like you hate waking up because you're afraid of what's going to happen when you go to school, how people are going to treat you. Maybe for you, you have family issues at home or you're just like home is not a safe place for you. You're always trying to escape out with friends, you know, getting, getting out of the house. But, but those things are hard. Those things are hard in our life and those things are what we would call adversity. So the Bible talks about adversity, and our, ser our series is really about adversity, but adversity is really a, a fancy word for tough times. So this series is about how God wants to work through the tough times happening in your life. 
You guys are going through tough things. And God wants you to know that he wants to work in those things in your life. So in your tough times, God wants to reach out to you. And he wants to help you overcome those things in your life. Six months before the most terrifying day of our lives, my sister, dad, and I moved to Fort McMurray from the Philippines to fulfill the long dream of reuniting with my mom after eight years. On May 3rd of 2016, I witnessed the wildfire break loose and the city turn into hell from across my classroom window. The bell would ring every now and then, which made me think it was a serious matter. I went to get my sister and called my parents to pick us up but they were stuck in traffic. When we were driving home, everybody was packing their things and suddenly the radio station we were tuned into said they had to evacuate and just wished everybody good luck. We got a call to leave right away as the whole city was being put under mandatory evacuation. Our plan was to head to Edmonton, but the roads were jam packed and Highway 63 was burning so that it was impossible for us to make it out. We decided to head to the oil camps where the usual one hour drive took us 11 hours. We spent the night in one of the lounges with other evacuees, with dogs barking and birds chirping next to us. The next day we learned that the fire was heading to where we were. We attempted to drive to Edmonton again, but we were sent back to the camps by the officers saying it was too dangerous, and I started feeling trapped. That night, we saw pictures of the fire heading towards our house, and we all couldn't help but just burst into tears, feeling helpless. My dad, wearing the same clothes for three days, decided that we would take the first flight out the next morning. While my mom and I were grabbing our stuff, they started calling everybody that's going to Edmonton to line up. We were first in line, but we couldn't go yet because my sister and dad were out of the building securing our car and taking important things with them. My mom and I started panicking as the plane got full. They arrived on the very last minute and we flew to Edmonton not knowing what was next or anybody. I remember my mom crying in relief as we sat on the plane safe and complete. Weeks went by we were hopping from church to church every Sunday. My parents brought up the idea of staying here in Edmonton for good, and I hated that idea so much, knowing I needed to start my life all over again. I blamed God for the wildfire, questioning Him why He let it happen, knowing I was just recovering from being depressed and suicidal. Someone told us about Celebration Church, telling me I would definitely love the worship. The next church my parents went to was Celebration and absolutely loved it. They could not stop talking about it. They went back, this time with me and my sister. And the moment I entered, I felt at home instantly. I remember telling my parents right after the service that this is my church. It gave me a reason to stay here in Edmonton. And after two weeks of attending, I took the chance to sign up for a connect group thinking that was the only way I could gain friends and my life back again. One of the girls asked me to do summer interns and I did, even though I did not know what it was about. It was where I started gaining a better understanding of God and developed an intimate relationship with Him. After Risen Camp, I became more involved in the ministry, this time with the right understanding of why I do what I do. Celebration Church has opened doors for me to do things I've never imagined I would, unlock the potential I have, and help me build God-centered relationships along the way. This journey is a proof that our God is powerful, and He is the God who can turn every bad thing into a beautiful one. My life right now is not how I wanted it to be, but it's definitely far better than I could ever have imagined. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says, 
For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What I love about Heidi's story is that in the beginning of the story, like that was tough times. That was tough times. She was going through tough times. Like I'm about to lose my house and my life and I don't know what's next. And she didn't, she didn't know what God had in store for her, but as she continued to trust God, as she continued to believe that, you know what, God's in control, he's gonna help me, he's gonna come through for me, her life is better today than she could have ever imagined before any of that stuff happened. And the truth is, tonight, that for you, God wants you to know that whatever tough times you're going through, whatever it is that you're facing that you're struggling with, he knows about it, he cares about it, and he wants to do good things in your life. He wants to make your life better than you can possibly imagine it right now. And really what I want you to understand, like I have like one, one, one thing I want you to remember. If you remember anything from tonight, this is what I want you to know, is that God knows the end from the beginning he knows everything that's going to happen in your life. He already knows. He already knows. And if you will choose to trust him, if you will choose to say, you know what, I don't know how this is going to end up, but God, I want to trust you. I'm just going to give it to you. I'm just going to believe that you're going to come through for me, that you've got my back. If you will do that, God promises us that he's going to work good. He promises us that he's going to come alongside us, that he's going to work with us, that he's going to comfort us, he's going to help us get through those things in our life. That's what, that's what this is all about. In 1 Peter, this is where we see part of the promise. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Set aside self-righteous pride so that he may exalt you to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time. Here it is. This is the promise. Casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares for you. That's God's word straight to you. Hey, cast your cares on me because I care about you. And God wants you to know tonight that whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but you do. And you, I'm sure you can feel it. It's tugging on your heart. Whatever that is, God wants you to know, hey, I know about that. I feel your pain. And I care for you, and I want to help work through that in your life. So I'm just going to do something real simple. We're just going to do something real simple. I just want to pray. We're just going to pray to God. We're going to ask God, like, hey, this is what I'm going through, and I just want to cast it on you. So what I want you to do right now, if you're in this place and you're going through some tough times, you've got some stuff that's tough in your life, I want you to think about it right now. Get it on your mind. And I'm going to get everyone to bow their heads. We're all going to bow our heads. We're all going to pray together. And I just want you to throw up your hand. Just letting me know, hey, I'm praying. I'm, I'm releasing. You're letting God know. Hey, I've got some tough times that I need help with. Thank you. i got some tough times. I need your help. I want to cast that on you. I don't want to carry that burden anymore. I don't want to carry that weight, that pressure anymore. I want to give it to you. That's awesome. We're all going to pray this together. And you're, you're praying this to God and he hears you. God, we ask you. Pray with me, guys. God, we ask you tonight to come alongside us to help us overcome in our tough times. We are choosing to trust in you, knowing that you will work through our tough times for good. We cast our cares on you because you care for us in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give it up for those people. That's awesome. We as leaders, we care about you too. You can talk to us, share with us, let us know what's going on. We want to be there for you to help you walk this out and help you to grow in your relationship with God. Before we close, I want to do one last thing, and that is really to just talk to anyone here tonight who you're saying, you know what, this idea of trusting in God is kind of new. Like, it's not really something I've done before. And I got to tell you this. God wants to work 
good things in our life. He wants to help us overcome the tough times. But the biggest thing that God wants to help us overcome in our life is the fact that we are disconnected from him. We don't have a relationship with him without us choosing to accept him. And that is the biggest thing that he wants to change in our life. That is the biggest thing that he wants to work through. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna close before giving you an opportunity. If you're here tonight and you're saying, I want that connection. I wanna be able to trust in God. I want a relationship with God. I've never made that choice before. I want to ask him for forgiveness. And I wanna be a Christian. I wanna follow God. That's, that's, you know that that prayer is for you tonight. We're all gonna bow our heads one last time. And if you're here tonight and that's you and you're saying, I, Christian, that's my prayer. I just need to accept Jesus. I just need to invite Jesus into my life. That's me. I just want you to throw up your hand so I know who I'm praying with. Awesome, thanks guys. That's good. That's awesome. We're gonna pray this all together. Jesus, we wanna know you. We want a relationship with you. We ask you for forgiveness. We're choosing to follow you from this day forward. Be the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give it up for those people.